There's an old Irish joke about a tourist asking directions. The answer given was, well, I wouldn't start from here. The starting point in this video is similar. How to fix a non-working Pixie QRP transceiver. Even when it's properly working, the Pixie is a toy in the hands of beginners, and many fruitless calls will be the result. And when it's not working, it can be a dog to troubleshoot. Yet because it's so cheap, people keep buying the things and asking me how you troubleshoot them. There is beauty and elegance in simple circuit design. There's also great satisfaction when it works. Troubleshooting actually becomes harder when you get into stupidly simple designs. The simplest project to troubleshoot is one in which the signal progresses in a linear fashion from start to finish. In this case, a simple CW transmitter generates the signal in the crystal oscillator, then a buffer for isolation, and a key final amplifier stage. If the signal is not present at all, the first thing you do is check if the oscillator is oscillating or not. If the signal is there, but at much lower than expected power output, then you check the buffer stage and then the final amplifier. Or maybe the signal is on all the time, then you check to see if there's something wrong in the keying circuit, keeping the transmit on. A simple transceiver like this, which is a basic direct conversion CW transceiver, is also quite simple to troubleshoot. With this arrangement, you can start by troubleshooting the receiver, and if that's working, move on to the transmitter. In this case, a working receiver automatically means that the local oscillator is operating, as is the detector and the audio amplifier stage. If there's something wrong with the transmitter, then you've suddenly isolated it just to these two stages. Similarly, if the transmitter is working and not the receiver, then the receiver problems have to be in these two stages, unique to the receiver. In summary, one function per active component makes a circuit a lot easier to troubleshoot. There's a few other things I haven't gone into, which increase the complexity of the Pixie. For instance, the role of these diodes, and here we've got a potentiometer, and its duty is to provide a transmit-receive frequency offset. You need a small transmit frequency offset, because otherwise, if you're dead on frequency with a direct conversion receiver, you won't hear the other station's signal, because you'll be zero beat. Having warned the Pixie is harder to troubleshoot than some more straightforward designs with separate transmitter and receiver circuitry, I'll talk about it anyway. If I was given a Pixie to look at, the first thing I'd do is check the quality of the soldering underneath the board. Connection should look shiny, but with not too much solder, and tracks should not be bridged. The other thing you want to check is whether the right components are in the right holes. Sometimes that can be made difficult, because there's actually several versions of the Pixie circuit on the web. Also, quality control can suffer, and you might have a Pixie kit that's not supplied with the correct values. In some cases you can get away with wrong values. For instance, a bypass capacitor from the positive rail to earth doesn't really matter whether it's 100 nanofarad or 10 nanofarad whereas in other parts of the circuit the values are a bit more fussy and can make the difference between a working pixie and one that doesn't work at all. Anyway, let's assume they're okay, you apply power to the pixie, the first thing I'd do is get another receiver, let's say around 7 MHz, and see if you can tune the signal generated by the pixie's local oscillator. 
in this case 7023, which seems to be a common frequency that pixies are supplied with. If you can hear a loud carrier on that signal on an adjacent receiver, then at least you know the crystal oscillator is working fine. The next thing I do is troubleshoot the audio stage. That just requires a finger and a screwdriver. Put on your headphones, apply power, and with a screwdriver, put that on pin number three, preferably holding the barrel of the screwdriver. If you don't hear a hum, then that means the receive audio stage is faulty and you won't be able to receive anything. The other part of the Pixie circuit is a bit more complicated. Um, if you are able to hear a faint signal on your 7 MHz receiver, but can't get much of a power output, then it could be a problem in your Pi low pass filter. Maybe you didn't put the inductor in right, or it could be open circuit. Or maybe you put in the wrong value capacitors. Instead of 470 picofarad in this circuit, let's say you put in 100 nanofarad, then at RF, that's basically a short circuit across the output, and you'll hardly hear any signals on receive or emit strong signals on transmit. So again, check your component values. Another important technique is to trace voltages. Although I didn't measure mine, I'd expect the emitters to be a couple of volts above ground and for the collectors to be near the supply rail. The base a little bit above the emitter in voltage. If all else fails, maybe you're better off to order another Pixie. After all, it's only $5 and a fairly cheap learning experience. Hopefully you won't lose interest and if you still can't get it to work, then maybe try another design. Something that might have one or two more transistors, but be a lot easier to troubleshoot. If you want to know more about my recommendations for other QRP rigs that might give you better results than the Pixie, don't go past Minimum QRP. It's a Kindle ebook available for under $5 US. Just visit Amazon.com and search Minimum QRP.